Hi, welcome back to Biology. Uh, my name is Mr. Kabuski. This is your biology class. Uh, welcome back. We've been talking about DNA. Uh, last time we got together, we talked about the structure of DNA and the scientists that are credited with discovering the structure and some different things about DNA. Today, we're going to talk about how to make more DNA, and that's through a process called DNA replication. We're going to answer three key questions. Uh, what is replication, first of all? Like, what's the definition of it? Uh, how does it occur? And then how do we prevent mistakes from occurring? Uh, in the DNA uh, during replication or just in, in general? How do we prevent more mistakes from occurring? Uh, if you have questions, feel free to contact me. My contact information is on the right. Let's get started. Okay. So what is DNA replication? Replication is making an exact copy of a DNA strand. Now, obviously, to replicate means to make a copy. So DNA replication, making more DNA. That's simple, okay? The cool thing about DNA replication is we call it semi-conservative. And what that means is that we're actually going to use the old strand to make the new strand. So every new piece of DNA is actually going to contain a piece of the old DNA. So if you look here in our first picture, we've got our staircase here, uh, and our ladder, however you want to look at it, okay? Obviously, there's two sides to it. During replication, those sides are split. So I have one side on the left, one side on the right, and now the hydrogen bonds between the bases have been cut. They're no longer there. And now I add new bases to each side, to their complement. So if this was an A and this was a T originally, then a T would go here and then an A would go here. I do that all the way down until every base is matched up. When I'm done, I have two new ladders, and each ladder, again, contains one of the old strands, which is the red, and then a new strand. Okay. Now, if you're taking notes uh, using my uh, website and using my notes, my PDF notes, these notes are going to be called combination notes. What that means is I want you to write down the details, the information goes in the left column, and then I want you to actually draw illustrations on the right. Now, I'm not expecting you to be a great artist. If you are, please do detail, make it look great. If you're not, you can just do stick lines. It's not a bit, you can just do like, okay? Not the end of the world. You can do simple stuff like that, okay? But you're gonna wanna add pictures, okay? DNA replication is a very visual uh, topic. It's a very visual process. But the problem is it happens on such a small scale that you're really not going to be able to see it uh, occur without like animations or pictures. So I would encourage you to take uh, these notes and draw pictures as you go. You know, pause it right now and maybe draw what you see here on the screen. You'd be surprised how well things start to stick in your memory uh, just by drawing some pictures that go along with what you write down. So keep that in mind as we go. Uh, this obviously occurs in the nucleus. That's where our DNA is contained, and then it takes place before cell division. Like that's the reason we need to do DNA re a replication is we need to mo make more DNA. Uh, in order to make more cells. Okay, so how does replication occur? There's actually uh, th several steps, but we're going to learn about three here in uh, honors biology. The first step is using something called DNA helicase. Now you should remember when I see ACE at the end of a word, that means it's an enzyme. So this is a specific enzyme that works on the DNA helix. Remember we learned that enzymes are named after the things that they do work on. So the DNA helix is unwound, so it's straightened out to make a nice ladder. And then it's actually going to be unzipped. If you watch in the little animation here, okay, we're actually going to split open the DNA, uh, unzip it. So the helicase actually cuts the hydrogen bonds right down the center of it. So if you watch the animation here, here's your blue helicase, okay, and it's going to just split all these little hydrogen bonds separating the bases on one side or the other, okay? Now where the DNA splits, that's known as the replication fork. So here is our replication fork on either side, this whole area, the open area, that's known as the replication fork, because that's where replication is actually going to occur. Okay, now again, you're going to want to draw a picture. Maybe you want to draw this one. Uh, maybe you want to draw the one previous, something like that. Either way is fine with me. When I draw it, uh, I do like my train tracks here. I don't know if you can kind of see. Then they split and go opposite directions. And then right here in the middle, I always do, draw helicases like a, a triangle. I think of it like a wedge. Like I wedge it between there, and as it goes through, it splits apart those bases, okay? So I draw a helicase as a little triangle going right through and opening up this replication fork. The replication fork, I drew a big outline around it. You probably can't see it in the orange, and I labeled that, okay? So again, there would be my helicase starting my replication fork. Okay, step two. We use something called DNA polymerase. Now, this is actually what's going to make the new strands of DNA. There's actually two of them working at the same time. There's one working up here at the top, okay, on this strand. And then there's one working down here on this bottom strand, but you'll notice they go in opposite directions, okay? They're always going from what we call the five prime to three prime end. Now what that means is that on the carbons, uh, excuse me, yeah, on the sugars, 
of DNA, there's actually five carbons. There are five carbon sugars. We label them uh, in a certain way. And the ones that are exposed that don't have anything bonded to them are either the three prime carbon, which would be down here on the top and on this side, or the five prime carbon on this end. So if I have my five prime up here at the top on this side, then the opposite has to be on the other side. This has to be the three prime end. Now I know that because DNA is anti-parallel, meaning they go in opposite directions. So if this side goes five to three to the right, the opposite side goes five to three to the left, okay? So this polymerase can work to the right, this polymerase has to work to the left. Now, why is that a problem? Well, the problem is the helicase is constantly moving in this direction, moving to the right, opening up the bases. So that means that this polymerase on the top can just keep working. It never has to stop. It's just going to keep on going, keep on keeping on. On the bottom, though, he just can't keep going because he's made of that section already. So he's going to work until he gets to the section that he's already done. He's going to have to stop, and he's going to go all the way back to the new pieces of DNA that have been opened up, which will be down here now. Okay, and then he's going to have to do this section. And then when he finishes that, he's going to go all the way back. Okay, so we name the two sides differently. The top side we call the leading strand. That's why I have leading up here. Because it never has to stop. It just keeps going. It's going to work really fast. It just keeps matching up those bases. It's going to grab the free nucleotides in the nucleus and then add those to the corresponding, the complement, and then just keep adding them and just keep making DNA as it goes. The other side then is known as the lagging strand. And what it does is it has to work in small sections and then stop and then go all the way back. So it does a section, stops, goes back. Does a section, stops, goes back. Does a section, stops, and goes back. Those sections we call Okazaki fragments, okay? And they don't actually connect to one another. We need one more piece of the puzzle in order to connect the two uh, Okazaki fragments, or excuse me, several Okazaki fragments. And for that, we use something called DNA ligase. So you'd have to imagine, if you give me a second to grab my colors, and I know I'm running out of time here. This polymerase is going to keep working in this direction. Okay, he's going to keep adding bases. So here's a base, here's a base, here's a base, here's a base, or excuse me, a nucleotide actually to be specific. But now I have a gap here between the two Okazaki fragments, okay? So I have one Okazaki fragment here, and then I have another Okazaki fragment right here, okay? So I have two fragments. How am I going to combine the two? Well, now I use something called, and let me grab my purple here, DNA ligase, which is another enzyme that's going to come attach, okay, to the DNA, and it's going to fill the gap between the nucleotides. That's all it does. So now it's a nice straight line. So DNA ligase, it fills the gap. So in our picture right here, you can see our DNA ligase. We have two separate sections of DNA, and now they've been combined to form one nice even strand. Okay? So those are the three steps of DNA replication. So you got to think, this DNA, we're talking about like billions of nucleotides that we're going to be copying, and this is happening constantly in your body. Like right now, as you're watching this, there's probably close to 10,000 cells in your body that are doing DNA replication as we speak. That's insane. Think about how much DNA that is. There's going to be mistakes. Things are going to go wrong, okay? But as it works, the DNA polymerase actually is going to proofread the DNA, and it should, if it works correctly and nothing's affecting it, it should not move on to the next base until it is matched at the other bases perfectly and correctly. Now, occasionally, things do go wrong and things do get mismatched, and that's known as a mutation. And that's when there's a change in the DNA sequence. And we'll talk more about mutations uh, in our next unit when we talk about protein synthesis, okay? But mutations occur all the time. Uh, for the most part, uh, like I said, there's probably mutations in your DNA, but it's usually in the junk DNA that really doesn't do anything, so it doesn't affect you a lot. Uh, but you can see down here, here's a mutant tomato. Uh, yeah, that's a tomato, believe it or not. Here's a mutant petunia. It's supposed to be white, and it's got this little red section. And then obviously here is a mutant turtle. Come on, you know that's funny. All right, that's enough of that. I'm sure you're getting a good laugh at it. I hope you appreciate it, okay? Uh, but there are three things that can increase the rates of mutation. That's UV rays, like exposure to sunlight, overexposure to sunlight, or to tanning beds. Think about this, people. Okay, uh, chemicals, especially things like preservatives in your food. You got to be careful about what you're putting into your body. And then radiation, uh, decaying atoms that give off radiation can increase your rate of mutation. About one in every billion uh, nucleotide bases is mis mismatched. Uh, in your DNA. So think about that. Uh, all the billions, so there's probably a mutation in just about every one of your cells. So usually not a big deal. Sometimes it is a big deal and it causes these physical changes. Not always for the bad. Sometimes it's for the good. And that's what actually leads to evolution, what we'll talk about later on.
Okay? So the main idea is what is DNA replication? How does DNA replication occur? And how are mistakes prevented? All right, we're going to go real quickly. This is actually a really good video that's on YouTube. Uh, I'm not going to take credit for it. Somebody else made it. But uh, here, and I'm going to stop the video uh, sound so I can actually talk over it. But I'm just going to briefly go over what exactly is happening because it's a really good animation and they did a really good job of it. And you can go to that website down below. But this is DNA helicase right here. And you can see it's unwinding the helix and opening up the two strands. Remember, this is known as our replication fork. This is DNA polymerase. And again, we said it's going from the five prime to three prime direction. And since this one is following the helicase, that's called the leading strand. The other side then is called the lagging strand because it has to lag behind because it also has to go from the five to three. So it's going to go have to go to the left here. So this side then is going to make Okazaki fragments. And you can see uh, my little thing is in the way, so it's hard to see them. But again, it has to work five prime to three prime. So here's my helicase. Here's the opposite polymerase on the leading strand. Don't worry about the RNA primer stuff. We'll talk more about that later. But here's our polymerase. And it's going to start adding bases in the opposite direction. So it's made this red section then is your new Okazaki fragment. Remember, Okazaki fragments can only occur on the lagging strand. And so here's your Okazaki fragments. Same thing that I drew right up here. Okay. So again, the polymerase is going to match the bases. Don't worry about the difference between polymerase 3 and polymerase 1. We're not going to deal with that a whole lot. But then here is our DNA ligase that links the fragments. Again, it's a really good animation. I really appreciate the people that made that. I'm going to pause it right there. I'm going to leave it at that. I hope you got something out of this. Again, here's my picture. Hopefully you drew your own. Uh, again, you'd be surprised how much that makes a difference, especially to those of you that are visual learners. But even for those of you that aren't, to be able to go back and see that picture and be able to relate it to the things that you wrote down, that helps you to process the information, helps it to stick a little bit better, and helps it to, to make more sense. There's the bell. I got to go teach this one more time. Have a great day.